Okay, now good morning, everyone. Um, hope folks are doing well. We have a little bit of a change in our regularly um, recorded, <laughs> our, our, our regular schedule. Sorry, I'm, we'll get the brain functioning again. Um, but I think this will be a really great, great switch for us, something that um, probably this group doesn't always think about as much. And i um, really excited about this talk from um, Dr. Sam Kaplan and uh, just a little bit about Dr. Kaplan since I think folks don't know her um, as well since she hasn't been involved in the HIV world quite the same as some of her other fellows. Um, so she um, received her uh, medical degree at Yale School of Medicine, and while at Yale, she spent a year as an NIH Fogarty Global Health Fellow in Cape Town, South Africa, where she conducted research on the risk factors and outcomes of patients living with HIV who disengaged from antiretroviral therapy in South Africa. Um, after medical school, she completed internal medicine residency at the University of Washington as a Global Health Pathway resident. Uh, part of which involved research in Western Kenya on latent tuberculosis and HIV and pregnancy. She then worked as a hospitalist in Seattle before coming to UCSD for ID fellowship. Um, she's completing the clinician educator pathway and ID fellowship. She's in her second year um, while pursuing vector-borne disease research related to climate change. Uh, she has also accepted a clinical faculty position as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Denver, Colorado, where she be move, where she will be moving in the summer. So, she's actually no stranger to what we do, but has has taken a turn or has taken a turn. So, it'll be really interesting to hear what you've been working on and what you've been <clears throat> thinking about. Sounds good. Thanks, Jill. Sure. Yeah. So, more of a global health uh, presentation rather than. HIV, but um, yeah, excited to share this with you all. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to be talking about basically an overview of uh, climate change and infectious diseases, and I'll talk a little bit about my project at the end, but stay tuned for ID Grand Rounds in about a month because there'll be more about my research in that presentation. Um, so I have no disclosures. Learning objectives for today will be to define climate change, describe some of its impact on human health, and understand how it's affecting the spread of infectious diseases globally. And then specifically describe how various climactic factors play into the spread of vector-borne diseases, particularly dengue and malaria. Um, and off of that, understanding the utility of predictive modeling and early warning systems to kind of help um, uh, prevent these diseases in the future, and then I'll describe my current project at the end, which looks at dengue and malaria co-occurrence in Peru. So let's clarify some definitions. Um, so and for those of you who are not meteorologically inclined, when we refer to weather, it refers to the atmospheric conditions at a specific moment in a given area. So it's raining today in San Diego, or the outdoor temperature today is 35 degrees Celsius. Versus climate refers to the atmospheric conditions in a given area for a long period of time. So it's really a statistical perspective of many weather observations in a given area. Um, the UN has a couple different definitions, but basically the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN refers to climate change as that can, that can be identified by changes in the mean or variability of um, its properties that persists for an extended period. So a change in weather over time. Um, but the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change um, refers to a change of climate that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that's on top of the natural climate variability. So slightly different definitions. So if we take a zoomed out view of temperature over the last 500 million years, there's definitely been a lot of changes in the climate in the past. Um, so what we're seeing in terms of the amplitude here doesn't seem quite impressive from this very zoomed out view. Um, but if you zoom in, uh, look at the temperature over the last 2000 years, what's been impressive is that it took place uh, pretty fast in the span of a few decades and it actually reversed a trend of temperature that was decreasing. Um, and it's also been due to human activity, which we'll get to on the next slide. 
Um, so yeah, four different data sources all showing kind of the same thing that temperature rise has been pretty drastic in the last 150 years. Um, and there's more and more articles coming out that's saying that we're really experiencing the warmest years on record. So in the last eight years, um, it's been the warmest. And if we look at some climate modeling, this, this slide just illustrates that you can see that modeling with and without greenhouse gas emissions, the um, earth would not have warmed so much. So this is without the blue line and then with, you can see that the, the temperature is going up. So contributing to um, the conclusion that this is um, anthropogenic or human driven. So uh, from a global perspective, climate change is really all about context. It's basically um, exacerbating current, um, you know, climate change exacerbates existing weather conditions and that creates really unprecedented situations. So if you um, look here, basically climate change increases people's vulnerability who are already vulnerable. So whether that's due to underlying health conditions, socioeconomic factors, socio-political conditions, as well as health system capacities. And that combines with these really unprecedented situations of heat stress and storms and um, uh, big weather events. And that leads to a variety of adverse health outcomes. So infectious diseases are really only um, a small piece of that. Um, def definitely climate change is known to, you know, worsen non-communicable diseases and heat-related illnesses, respiratory illnesses, among others. So just know that this is only um, a part of the puzzle. And this graphic is more just focused on the U.S. in terms of this is from the American Public Health Association. But um, again, climate change, it doesn't just refer to uh, rising temperatures that lead to health effects, but also extreme, wa extreme weather um, and air quality from greenhouse gas emissions that um, cause other health issues, including aggravating underlying um, illnesses like cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses. So we're going to zoom in on this particular piece and talk more about vector-borne diseases in the latter half of the talk. Um, and this just illustrates how changes in um, precipitation and change in temperature can really affect the geographical range and changes in vector behaviors, and that can increase the cases of vector-borne diseases that include Lyme, malaria, Zika, West Nile, but um, um, lots of others as well. So vector-borne diseases do get a lot of press, but also keep in mind that infectious diseases, um, disease spread is affected by many factors associated with climate change. So there's a lot of interplay between rising temperatures that can cause its own set of effects. Um, on um, antibiotic resistance, on the spread of endemic mycoses. We'll talk about that a little bit. But also there's you know, extreme weather uh, events that cause human migration and displacement, which places humans in close proximity. And so you get more risk of respiratory infections, vaccine preventable diseases as well, um, diarrheal illnesses. And then that places a burden also on water and sanitation systems as well. So you see um, issues with water quality, which can lead to a whole host of other things as well. So um, just uh, keep in mind that there's a lot of interactions between all of these things. Uh, we're just going to focus on a few of these um, infectious disease related outcomes to climate change. And so just, again, a part of the part of the puzzle. So this is kind of this, the outline of what I'm going to talk about in terms of broad strokes, and then I'll get to my project at the end, um, but give you kind of specific examples about how the climate is affecting uh, particular diseases. So in terms of pathogen spread, um, this is an interesting study that was from 2005, actually, but it was an outbreak of Vibrio parahemolyticus on an Alaskan cruise ship, um, and so um, associated with oysters. So about 22 of 132 people interviewed um, had gastroenteritis, and they had also consumed raw oysters on the ship. And they were able to isolate Vibrio parahemolyticus from the majority of patients and also from environmental samples as well. And all the oysters associated with the outbreak um, were harvested when the mean daily water temperatures exceeded 15 degrees Celsius. So you can kind of see when they actually looked back um, at the temperatures um, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so, 
the, the temperature of the water was actually increased so much that it, it exceeded this threshold and that allowed the Vibrio paralytic to kind of thrive in the oysters and cause this outbreak. Another trend to note is the spread of endemic mycoses, such as coxie. And so this paper particularly was predicting um, the spread of coxie for the next 100 years. And you can kind of essentially see in the next 30, 60, 90 years that it's going to spread or at least be endemic for a lot of the Western US. And the, um, the, the hypothesis is basically that with increased temperatures, there's a more suitable environment for these spores of coxie to survive in the soil. And so um, there'll be a greatly expanded range. And this is not just true for coxie, it's true for other, um, other endemic mycoses as well. And then uh, I would be remiss without mentioning Candida auris. So um, there is also the, you have to mention the emergence of new fungal pathogens. So Candida auris is a new, um, newly discovered pathogen. Its uh, earliest description came from actually a strain that was recovered from a human ear in 2009, which is a little bit cooler temperature on the human body. And um, so usually we do, you know, mammals, because we have higher basal temperatures, it kind of protects us from fungal infections. Um, there's a thermal restriction zone, but as well as our immune host defenses as well. But, um, you know, Canada auris may have gone through this kind of transient phase where it, it used to live at cooler temperatures and then it kind of was living on the skin and, uh, and uh, is able to inhabit kind of cooler areas of the body in humans and then eventually able to cause, um, cause disease. So when you look at its kind of uh, genetic background, it is capable of growing at higher temperatures than most of its closely related species. So there has been some evolution there. But the interesting part is that it emerged kind of simultaneously on three continents, and each of these clades were genetically distinct, so likely did not come from one strain that became azole resistant, but these all kind of emerged simultaneously, which suggests an environmental origin. So um, this graphic from um, this paper kind of goes into that of why it might have emerged. So it might have been kind of a plant saprophyte in, in wetland environments, and then it may have gained some thermotolerance as a, result, as a result of the climate effects on wetlands, and then probably uh, transplanted by uh, birds to rural areas with humans. We also know that birds like seagulls can be reservoirs for candida glabrata, so that would not be a new thing for candida. Um, and then it also could have gotten some resistant plasmids from other, other candida species um, in wetlands as well. And so eventually, once it kind of made its way to rural environments, it made its way to urban environments, and then now can be nosocomial spread, as we've seen um, with Candida auris and um, skilled nursing facilities, et cetera. Um, so yeah, in terms of emerging fungal pathogens with global warming, I have to mention The Last of Us. I don't know if you guys have seen this HBO show, but <laughs> we're not really at the stage where uh, people with Candida auris are going around biting people and infecting them. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. But maybe soon. <laughs> maybe soon, we'll see. <laughs> um, okay, so talking more about changes in host ecology and zoonoses, I thought this was a pretty interesting example. Um, and thanks to um, Dr. Abelis, who I got this slide from. But uh, in 2015 in central Kazakhstan, there's about over 200,000 of these specific um, antelopes that died in a three-week period in a mass mortality event, and actually the cause of death was sepsis from pastorella, um, which is normally a commensal organism for them. It lives in their mouths, and the um, hypothesis being that these, you know, there are very high temperatures and humidity that led up to the event, and that these higher temperatures allowed breach of mucosal barriers in the pastorella to get into the antelope's bloodstream and cause sepsis. So all these kind of um, changes in host ecology that can contribute to, to changes in the environment um, and infectious disease. Increase in zoonoses is another um, big effect that we are seeing, will see. So um, this paper particularly looked at all emerging infectious diseases over a time period um, from 1940 to 2004. And so they analyzed 335 events and found that there is an increasing number of events over time that corresponded with climate anomalies. Most of these, like 60%, were zoonoses, and uh, over 70% of those originated in wildlife. So 
And they also saw that there was a substantial risk of these wildlife zoonotic and vector-borne emerging infections that occurred at lower latitudes where there's higher temperatures. Uh, and this was another paper kind of illustrating this. So looking at the same phenomenon and modeling and predicting actually mammalian migration um, and predicting that basically the there's mammalian species that are going to meet for the first time as they move to cooler locations with rising temperatures. And so this map over here actually illustrates these kind of novel viral sharing events that overlap with human population centers. So red being more crossover events. Um, this will probably occur most likely in species rich ecosystems at high elevations, particularly areas in Africa and Asia that are pretty densely populated by humans. And they predicted that by 2070, the number of first time meetings between species will double to 4,000 crossover events. So um, a bit sobering, I would say. Um, to talk a little bit about increased susceptibility to respiratory infections, kind of the summary is that there's very variable effects. So we do know that young children and older adults are particularly susceptible to rapid fluctuations in temperature. And there was a study um, from Australia that, that showed there was a correlation between sharp temperature drops and childhood bacterial pneumonia. In terms of the flu, there's um, warm winters tend to be kind of followed by severe and early onset influenza the following season. Um, so it has some effects there, but in terms of RSV, we've actually seen that warmer winters may actually decrease the seasonality pattern. And so there's a particular study that looked at actually for every degree increase in temperature, the RSV season actually terminated three weeks earlier. So um, in summary, variable effects. Um, but to talk particularly about COVID, COVID's obviously a little bit, a lot more complicated. This is um, figure was taken from a recent paper from The Lancet. Essentially, there's a lots of interactions between climate change and COVID. We're not entirely you know, sure how temperature, wind, and humidity will influence transmission, but um, we do know, obviously, that you know, more non-climatic factors like human behavior and, uh, are more important in determining transmission. But these climate extremes do affect how people are exposed, uh, their disease susceptibility, and then compromised emergency and healthcare responses. So all of that kind of plays into... Um, the numbers of COVID, COVID-19 risk and mortality, or at least it has in the pandemic. We do know that um, air pollution has been related to COVID-19 mortality. Um, and I thought this paper was from kind of earlier in the pandemic, looking at air pollution and COVID-19 mortality in the US. And they did an ecological regression analysis, which basically used publicly available COVID-19 mortality rates that was regressed against area level pollution concentrations and showed that um, uh, the higher historical PM 2.5, which is a, is a measure of particulate matter, so 2.5 being one of the smallest particulate matters of organic compounds. Um, and those were associated um, exposures to to historical levels of PM2.5 are possibly associated with higher county level COVID-19 mortality rates after they adjusted for confounders. Um, and you can see here on the right, uh, the top map shows the county level 17 year long average of PM2.5 concentrations and then COVID-19 mortality on the bottom. So definitely some overlap. And one of the hypotheses is that this kind of chronic exposure to particulate matter causes potentially ACE2 receptor overexpression and impairs host um, defenses, but there's obviously a lot of other hypotheses as well. Um, and this was a particular paper actually from my research mentor, Tarek Benmarnia, um, that looked uh, specifically at wildfire smoke related to COVID-19 mortality. And this was um, in the San Francisco Bay area in August, 2020. Um, so you can see on the left, the red areas indicate this kind of heavy smoke coming in during mid to late August, with the red being um, more smoke coverage. And on the right, uh, they looked at by county, and this red background kind of indicates the percent of a county that's covered by smoke and the, the dotted line being when the exposure occurred. Um, so they didn't see it for every county, but certainly for Alameda and San Francisco County, they saw a pretty big increase in COVID-19 mortality as this um, smoke exposure happened. And you can see the, the difference because this gray line below here compared to the black is uh, kind of the baseline counties surrounding. So um, definitely increased the case fatality 
uh, ratio, at least for those couple of counties. Okay, just to talk a little bit about um, changes in antibiotic resistance. So we've also seen the antibiotic resistance increases with local temperature. Um, this paper particularly, it looked at 1.6 million clinically relevant pathogens um, over 41 states in a three-year period. And they found that an increase in local temperature as well as population density was associated with an increased um, antibiotic resistance in common pathogens. Um, so an increase in 10 degrees Celsius was actually increased antibiotic resistance of about 4% in E. coli and 2% both club pneumonia and staph aureus. And the hypothesis being that these increased temperature may facilitate horizontal gene transfer, uh, potentially transmission of resistance strains between animals and humans, or even growth of resistance strains in the environment and then that get transmitted to people um, through food or other means. And so this figure is also from that same paper, kind of showing a heat map here of resistance to E. coli for all antibiotics here in panel A. Um, and this is the actually 30 year average minimum temperature. So pretty, pretty similar looking uh, maps. And then panel C is showing this antibiotic resistance for the versus the minimum temperature for E. coli and amoxicillin. So seeing a clear trend of um, as you increase minimum temperature, you see more resistance to amoxicillin. Um, this is kind of an interesting figure showing the a relationship between the minimum temperature and antibiotic resistance for E. coli and uh, showing the strongest relationship actually for quinolones and amoxicillin or other beta-lactam. So there might be um, mechanism-specific impacts of temperature on resistance for these classes of antibiotics. Okay, and then finally, yeah, suitability for vectors. So Climate change, uh, this is gonna be the focus for the rest of the talk, but we know that um, the prevalence of vector-borne diseases has increased in re recent decades and that they're expected to further increase in the next 80 years. Um, and that the biological traits of these pathogens, the vectors, the reservoir, and the definitive host may be sensitive to climate, whether that's temperature and precipitation. Um, so just to illustrate that, this is from a recent New England Journal review that illustrates all of these concepts, um, but that global warming leads to warming of the oceans and kind of changing in the weather that lead to all of these various um, climatic trends and events, rising sea levels and floods and storms, droughts, heat waves. And from there, um, I'm gonna focus on the right part of the figure, but these droughts and storms and heat waves uh, lead to either creation or destruction of vector breeding sites. Um, and that changes, um, uh, that can also change the host and reservoir distribution and the interactions between humans and reservoirs and host. And then also as you increase the temperature, um, decreased frost, this leads to kind of thermal effects on the pathogens and vectors, especially if they're kind of already living at higher altitudes and latitudes and they're more temperature sensitive and that leads to these longer disease transmission seasons. And of course, all of these uh, lead to increased morbidity cases and impacts on people's livelihoods. And this paper particularly looked at areas that were suitable for disease transmission um, of vector-borne diseases over time. And um, so uh, on the left top panel here, we're looking at dengue and the global climate that was suitable for dengue actually increased by uh, 9% for Aedes albopictus, which is one of the mosquitoes that transmits dengue, and almost 15% for Aedes aegypti. So um, the capacity for these mosquitoes to survive and live has increased. And the same trend is kind of seen for malaria in the top right. Um, so suitability for transmission, um, and you can see it's mostly uh, the biggest increases are in the African region as well as the Western Pacific region as well compared to the 1950s. And we talked about Vibrio as well, but these bottom two panels just kind of show there's an increase in area of coastline that's suitable for outbreaks of Vibrio. So um, more and more areas that are increasing um, in area for suitability of transmission. Um, so let's talk a little bit about dengue. Dengue, I won't dwell on this slide too much, um, but uh, just to give a bit of a background, we know that dengue has, there's four major serotypes. It's transmitted by two um, 
mosquito species and they bite during the daytime and they usually live between um, usually equatorial um, latitudes, but we're seeing more and then less than a thousand meters of elevation. Um, symptomatically or clinically, it's incubation period of four to 10 days. The spectrum of disease can really range from asymptomatic to pretty severe. Um, we have various diagnostics that are not widely cheap and available. There's no, no treatment, it's just supportive. And then prevention and control mainly depend on vector control measures. There is a there is a new vaccine that's um, approved for use in young children who have had dengue before if they live in a dengue endemic area, but um, that is, is fairly new. And then <clears throat> if you are infected with one serotype, it doesn't prevent immunity to others, so it's a risk factor for more severe disease. And the global burden of dengue, so 3.9 billion people are estimated to be at risk, and 70% of that burden is in Asia. There's 390 million cases a year, um, although 96 million of those are actually symptomatic. And then an average of about 9,000 deaths a year, at least recorded. There's pretty, a pretty big disparity in reported and um, estimated cases in terms of, and that's issues with underreporting and under recognition as well. So how is dengue transmission affected by climate? There's a lot of interactions. <laughs> Uh, between the environment, the vector, as well as the virus itself. So temperature affects vector development. Um, it also affects uh, the survival um, of the vector and then also virus replication. And then both temperature and precipitation play a, in a role into habitat for mosquito, um, for the habitat for mosquito survival. Um, and the more mosquitoes that survive, obviously the better chance the virus has to replicate and be transmissible. So a lot of interactions at play. We know that increasing temperatures actually causes accelerated mosquito egg laying, increased survival and development rates through all the development phases, um, increased breeding activity, um, and faster virus replication within mosquitoes, as well as a shorter length of the extrinsic uh, incubation period, which is the time required for the mosquito to become infected. And so dengue transmission is predicted to kind of shift related to temperature. So in endemic areas, it may shift more to winter months as climate change leads to greater temperatures. And then in non-endemic areas, it may actually become endemic because the seasonal variability is going to increase. And this is kind of illustrated uh, <clears throat> by this paper, which used a mosquito population and virus transition model, which is um, driven by meteorological data to kind of simulate mosquito populations um, throughout the, the southeastern United States, and also using future climate projections and suggested that dengue transmission is, could be quite possible at several US locations, particularly Florida and Texas in the summer months. And then we're kind of already seeing that in Florida, actually. This is the um, kind of updated as of January CDC map of, of dengue cases. This includes travel as well as local transmission, but <clears throat> The only locally transmitted cases occurred in Arizona as well as Florida, but Florida had about over 50 um, in 2022. So we're, we're kind of already seeing it. So, um, and then increasing precipitation can also cause uh, effects on the vector as well as there's more rainfall, fills more containers and puddles, um, affects environments for mosquito breeding. Of course, too much precipitation may also wash out these habitats. On the other hand, droughts can increase people's human, you know, the human adaptation strategies to um, affect water storage. So it can kind of go both ways. We should also mention the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is this recurrent climate pattern that involves changing water temperature um, in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. So essentially every three to seven years, the waters can warm or cool from one to three degrees Celsius. And that directly affects rainfall distribution in the tropics um, and can affect pretty much temperature and precipitation across the world, but particularly in the Americas. Um, El Nino referring to the warming of the ocean surface and La Nina, the cooling, but that obviously both of them have effects of um, differing types of uh, affecting precipitation in different ways in different areas when they occur. So pretty complex. Um, in terms of dengue transmission being affected by climate, we also can't equate dengue incidents with vector populations because obviously it's also associated with how 
we interact with our environment and socioeconomic factors as well. And that has to do with where people live, their housing quality and the vegetation around tree cover, how they store their water, population growth and urbanization, and then also public health control measures specifically for these diseases. Um, and so just a little bit of background on malaria. So again, uh, I think everyone is familiar with the malaria caused by plasmodium parasites of four different species, calciparum being the most deadly, and it's transmitted by bites of the infected female Anopheles mosquitoes, which bite at nighttime. Um, the incubation period is 10 to 15 days. Most people have symptoms within a week to a few months, and Vivax in valley can actually remain dormant in the liver for months to years, causing relapsing malaria. Spectrum of disease is also quite wide from flu-like illness to severe. We obviously know there's certain higher risk groups. Um, and then um, I won't really review diagnostics and treatment, but essentially prevention focuses on vector control and then preventative chemotherapies for some. There is a vaccine for kids against falciparum, but we're gonna focus on the vector control aspect. Global burden of malaria, so 247 million cases worldwide. Um, and the WHO African region carries a hugely disproportionate share of this malaria burden. It was actually home to 95% of cases and 96% of malaria deaths in 2021, and 80% of those deaths are in children under five. So um, quite a large burden. Um, how is, it how is its transmission affected by climate? So in terms of temperature, we know that um, temperature influences also the lifespan growth and biting rates for um, Anopheles mosquitoes. They have an ideal water temperature. They also have kind of an optimum water temperature for transition from larvae to pupae. And it also influences the incubation period of the parasites themselves. So they have a quite um, ideal temperature range and it actually develops a lot faster when the temperature is warmer. So 12 days as opposed to greater than 30 days um, with just with a difference of five degrees Celsius. And precipitation, as I mentioned with dengue affects mosquito breeding environments. So similar to dengue. And to kind of illustrate the effect of temperature on malaria mortality, the study used a global malaria mortality data set for over 100 countries in a 30 year period and found um, a nonlinear relationship between temperature and malaria mortality. So on the left, you can see the change in malaria mortality due to temperature change um, predicted by the end of the 21st century. And on the right is for um, children ages zero to four. And they actually even estimated a global optimal temperature beyond which all age mortalities will increase. And it's a little bit lower for kids, but 20.8 degrees um, for adults. And this was another study that used simulations from uh, different cl global climate models, and each under under four different emission scenarios. So these are a little bit outdated in terms of how they measure emissions, but essentially knowing that as you go up in RCPs, you're increasing the total number of emissions. And this was to predict the length of malaria transmission seasons at several time points. And so um, in their models, as you increase the emissions um, into the 2080s, you can see that it greatly increases the malaria transmission season. But, um, uh, it's obviously very complex because it's just, malaria transmission is also affected by socioeconomic development. Um, if you have more financial stability, there's more access to safe housing, mosquito nets, insecticides. And so I thought this study was particularly interesting because it looked at GDP. Um, and so how it might affect areas at risk for malaria transmission. So red being, um, red is the expansion of people at risk for getting malaria. And so this is uh, this first panel is showing that climate change is only, if we only look at climate change, we'll see an increase in area of people at risk for malaria. If we only looked at GDP increases, we'd actually see a contraction. And panel C is actually a combined uh, climate change as well as GDP. And so they still predict actually a contraction of areas at risk for malaria. So another side of the situation, hopefully as, um, Countries' GDP increases and we improve poverty, that might also change the situation as well. Um, so what can we do in terms of adaptation strategies? 
So the adaptation strategies for vector-borne disease essentially fall into two big categories, community-based as well as individual and household strategies. So from a community-based standpoint, um, public policies such as limiting deforestation, um, household designs to limit mosquito entry, surveillance programs, vector control programs such as insecticides, genetically modified mosquitoes, um, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes as well, um, early warning systems, which I'll come back to, and then kind of public awareness campaigns. Of course, there's others as well, including increased um, uh, development of diagnostics that are inexpensive and widely available, drug development and monitoring for, um, for drug resistance, and then strengthening healthcare systems, access to healthcare, and improving poverty as well as housing. Um, but from an individual standpoint, uh, there's uh, also strategies that, that people use personal protective measures like bed nets and insecticides and protective clothing, and then making sure they seek attention for febrile illness as well as adhere to treatment plans. And then household interventions such as screens and insecticides as well as vaccines also play a role. But I'm gonna talk quickly about early warning systems because that's kind of the focus of the reason for my project. And just to define that for those who have not heard of early warning systems, they're basically um, accurate and timely climate informed systems that monitor all these drivers of vector borne diseases, climatic, environmental, as well as socioeconomic drivers um, that can be used to predict outbreaks. And the main kind of objective is that this collection of information leads to timely decision making processes on the broader governmental level. And that kind of triggers disease intervention strategies to reduce the effect of uh, the disease on a specific population. So. In other words, it's pretty, it's targeted surveillance and um, it's based on vector presence and activity, but also human movement. And so that includes socioeconomic factors, climactic factors, as well as from a spatial and temporal uh, perspective. An example would be actually Europe has, uh, has one that's called the European Network for Arthropod Vector Surveillance for Human Public Health. And it's a network of entomologists as well as public health specialists that work together to assist um, in preparedness activities for vector-borne diseases across Europe. Okay, so in the last um, five to 10 minutes or so, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Ship Gears and talk about the project that I've been working on at Scripps. Um, so just gonna show a few preliminary results. I'll talk about the background, but um, again, I'll be talking again about this in June at, at ID Grand Rounds if anyone wants to join then. But the project is looking at climatic factors to predict dengue malaria in Loreto, Peru. Um, it's a spatiotemporal analysis. And the motivation for this project is really, there's a really high burden of dengue in Latin America. This is a map that looks at October to December, 2022. And you can clearly see a pretty high burden as well as in Southeast Asia. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa definitely has the highest burden of malaria, but there is also a pretty high burden in uh, Latin America as well. And this is from a map from 2020. Why Peru particularly so has a really high burden of dengue and malaria. Um, also, there's members of my lab that are very familiar with the data, so had access to it and that helps. Um, but to give a little bit of background about Peru, it, it's over 30 million people, uh, has a wide range of environments from coastal to mountain and jungle regions, and then a rainy and a dry season. And the weather is particularly sensitive to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, so is also a good environment to study that effect on vector-borne disease. And so what we really wanted to look at so typically when you look at dengue, malaria, other vector-borne disease surveillance, it's pretty siloed. Um, you're looking at dengue or malaria or chikungunya or Zika. And it's uh, a lot of times that's related to different mosquito species that are carrying these vectors. Um, and the prevention strategies can be different. The funding can be different. <clears throat> but Peru particularly has both dengue and malaria, but not much data on the joint incidence. And they're driven by a lot of many common environmental factors. So we wanted to know, is there some way that we could predict kind of a joint warning system for both of them rather than separating them into silos? <clears throat> and we know that um, the, the motivation for this comes from previous studies that have looked at dengue and malaria individually. 
um, and how they're affected by climate on a, but on a spatial as well as a temporal scale. scale. So this study particularly looked at dengue um, from passive surveillance data in about a 20 year period um, and identified about 380 outbreaks of dengue, uh, over 88,000 cases. And uh, they found that these kind of jungle epidemics peaked in the rainy season prior to the coastal epidemics. Um, so you can see the jungle in red and then coast in blue here. And the differences in the timing of these were also associated with the seasonal temperature cycle. So concluded that dengue is kind of persistent in these jungle regions, but then these kind of peaks are imported into the coastal region. So prevention strategies should be focused in these particular areas. So it is very spatially, uh, spatial scale matters. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we also know that the El Nino Southern Oscillation and climate play um, a role uh, into dengue outbreak risk in Peru as well. Um, Peru is particularly sensitive to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And so this was a, a time series analysis um, looking at all districts within a lower elevation and found a pretty positive effect and significant effect of temperature and the El Nino Southern Oscillation on outbreak risk, but again, only in particular areas of the country. Similarly, the El Nino Southern Oscillation seems to have an effect on malaria as well. And this was a study that looked at kind of a few different uh, countries in South America um, from uh, the 50s through the 90s and found that um, in Peru, there was a significant correlation with um, El Nino's, uh, with El Nino Southern Oscillation events uh, with malaria epidemics, particularly in certain areas of Peru. And so we chose <clears throat> particularly to focus on Loreto, which is uh, the nation's largest uh, department. So it's about 1 million people. And the reason being that they had a, they continued to have a very large burden of both dengue and malaria. So over 10,000 cases of dengue in 2020, um, in the 90s, the malaria actually increased 50-fold in Loreto, but fourfold everywhere else, probably due to some deforestation and rural expansion. And uh, in 2015, actually, was responsible for 95% of the whole country's malaria burden, um, vivax being the most, uh, the most prevalent species. Um, and we know you can see that even though malaria kind of declined in incidence from 1998 to 2013, it stayed pretty high in Loreto. So, and that has to do with environmental factors, including deforestation and uh, vegetation, as well as socioeconomic factors of where people live and their occupations of farming, logging, and fishing. And so just to give a quick teaser of some data, kind of just... Um, looking here at dengue and malaria um, nationwide for Peru, um, pretty much indicating the malaria is pretty endemic um, for Peru. It kind of occurs um, pretty uh, persistently across years, but dengue is more epidemic and has certain years where um, you see these peaks. And what we also found interesting um, that I'll go into uh, more in about a month is that we're um, seeing these peaks of dengue and, um, and also kind of a decline in malaria at the same time. And so it's a little bit interesting whether this is a reporting issue or whether it's actually something to do with the vectors. Um, could a decline in malaria help predict dengue or vice versa? We're not really sure what's causing this, but this is also kind of illustrated in this graph where dengue is kind of um, transmitted more in the quote summer months of December and January. Um, and then um, if you look here, um, that malaria is slightly higher, more in the dry season in June and July, so a little bit reversed. And then just generally by age group, we're seeing dengue more in ages 21 to 40, which is these turquoise colors. So generally more, um, you know, older uh, or at least younger adults, and then definitely seeing a lot more kids with malaria as well, uh, with malaria as opposed to dengue. So with this coral and brown color. In Loreto, um, we see kind of similar trends in the spikes as nationwide in terms of there's endemic um, spikes for, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, endemic uh, malaria, but epidemic spikes of dengue. And this is just a cool map kind of showing um, vivax as well as falciparum over time in Loreto. So definitely can change a lot by year, um, but always kind of around. So um, 
that's just a preliminary, uh, some preliminary data. So we're definitely still mapping. We're bringing in more precipitation and temperature data and we're conducting time, uh, multivariate time series analysis. And so tuning in about a month for a little bit more on this project. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up there. This is kind of a summary of what I talked about today um, and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sam. That was really fascinating and scary. <laughs> These climate change talks. Um, um, Nettie just made a comment about, you know, just sort of local climate change and the experiences that we've that we've seen here. I don't know if you see it in the chat. It was more just a comment. Um, but I, do I was just to... noticing it in my backyard. No, I just, I remember I moved to a new house in North Park in 2015 and I called vector control because there were all these mosquito larvae in my standing water um, <laughs> and I was getting bitten and I found these beautiful long-legged gorgeous mosquitoes. And I remember when I moved to San Diego 20 years ago, the best thing about San Diego is that there were no mosquitoes. So I, I am not certain that it's an example of local climate change, but I assume so since the line for the um, Aedes mosquitoes has been moving further north. So definitely it was a big change in San Diego. And even if it's not due to climate change, I'm using it as an example to get everyone's attention. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, no, yeah, for sure. It, there's already a pretty wide, uh, a wide area the 80s mosquitoes are living. Um, and so I think we're just starting to see more and more local transmission of dengue, um, particular states like Florida, Arizona, but I think it's only a matter of time. <laughs> it was very noticeable because San Diego didn't use to have mosquitoes and all of a sudden everybody's like, why am I getting bitten during the day? And now here we are. Yeah. yeah. I'm waiting to see if others, if anyone else has a, oh, maybe Robert does. I'll ask something. Yes. Um, so Sam, great talk. I mean, super comprehensive. Um, do do any of these models take into account the loss of predators? Because, you know, that's another thing that's just going to happen. I imagine, you know, if temperatures keep getting warmer, um, you know, the predators will start dying out. And, and you know, anyway. I mean, the loss of predators for the mosquitoes is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and just all these sort of vectors uh, and without knowing too much about like what predators are. But, um, you know, it, it just seems like I, I don't know, I'm I'm sort of like Jill said, a little depressed and very pessimistic about this <laughs> stuff. And just imagine like with all the, you know, even with all the mitigation measures, like it's just going to get worse and worse in ways we can't imagine. But <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, the particular, I, I don't think any of the particular papers I looked at looked specifically at, at predicting the predators, but, um, you know, I do think there's more and more uh, novel ways of vector control, and I, you know, I didn't talk about this in detail. In addition to early warning systems, there's kind of, you know, genetically modified mosquitoes and um, you know, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. And so I think we're coming up with more novel ways of, of vector control. Um, so I think, you know, it is, it is yes, it's, it's bleak. I think climate change in general is bleak because it's not just ID. It's like so many other effects on chronic diseases too. But uh, I do think that there are some, some novel things coming up, so. Didn't, and it's mean, fair. didn't mean to it's, depress you. This no, it's fair. I mean, it's reality and we have to know, you know, to be able to be uh, able to deal with it. We must cultivate our garden like uh, Voltaire said. Right? So. Yeah. Um, can you see the question from Nettie about um, how well the Wolbachia infected mosquito intervention and how I, well it works? I don't know how well it works, to be honest. Um, I can you talk you. about what it is for those? Who may not know what that is, including yeah, sure. myself. <laughs> well, Bacha is a particular kind of bacteria that affects um, the transmission, like in the in the mosquito itself, and so can basically uh, affect how um, how dengue is it's essentially cutting off the transmission of dengue. Yeah. Um, and I think it's uh, I'm not sure if it's been used for malaria as well, but it's a good question. I'll have to to look, to read a little bit more about it. My my silly like household question, you know, I get my 
energy bill statements and <laughs> I get compared to my neighbors and it makes me feel bad if I'm not doing better than my neighbors or at least like, you know, the same at the same rate. But I, you know, we all talk about the fact that yes, probably, I mean, I can make some changes, but does it really matter what each person does in a very, very small scale if we don't make changes for the massive organizations that are mostly promoting, um, you know, the, the all of what we're seeing right now? I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm asking a rhetorical question. I think I get frustrated <laughs> when I'm like, you have to do better. I'm like, I'm doing as well as I can. Sorry, I should have this light off. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what? have there been studies to show what the very small changes that individuals make can do compared to the, you know, the scale that these large corporations can do? Yeah, I, um, I, I haven't, I don't know particular studies, but um, I, you know, obviously, yes, policy is super important. <laughs> um, and particularly global policy, right? It's not just US policy, oh, but it's for, the UN. Yeah. And looking sure, sure, at, sure. Well, that's um, why it's hard, right? Yeah. To, to walk around in the dark and knock into things, get through stuff. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's my experience. And but, um, does it matter? You know, and obviously I'm being... But Cal California, I mean, there's, you know, there's supposed to be all electric vehicles in the next, what, 10 years. So I think um, certain places are making more like better policy changes that I'm hoping will help. Yeah. Courtney says a plug to go. Yeah. Vegan. Yeah. No, I mean. <laughs> if we stop buying all those products, right, the products from the from the uh, from these organizations, it's it's really it's really challenging. Yeah. Um, anyway, all right. I don't know if Robert wants to say learning about the greenhouse effect of fourth grade. <laughs> right. he won't well, disclose the it's year. great that there are people working on these, you know, on these really important issues, and that this is such a you know a growing field and we're very happy that you are doing it can I are you will you continue to do this work when you go to um University of Colorado yeah I hope so I am there's actually a climate and health center there um it's actually mostly run out of the emergency medicine department but they collaborate with a few people across different disciplines and so there'll be some some opportunity to for some collaboration so I'm excited for that that's interesting. Why does it come out of their emergency department? I think they are focused a lot on sustainability and how they can kind of improve energy and sustainability from a hospital and kind of healthcare utilization standpoint. Um, but, uh, you know, they go to the, the global climate conferences every year and they have a fellowship program. And so I think there's a lot of room for, for ID to be involved. <laughs> Well, I think we all look forward to hearing more about it in a month. Um, I'll just ask, I don't know if it's something that you can think about to add, because I don't, and I don't know if this will be part of the talk. I know that there was, you know, obviously the hospital produces a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's part of this at all. So forgive my, my ignorance if it, if it's not. Um, but I, I do think that's such an interesting discussion, right? We focus so much on how we can reduce reuse in our homes, yet, you know, maybe in one patient interaction, we've put on three different pairs of gloves, you know, where the operating rooms are a whole other place. Um, all of the, the diseases that we put on our gowns for, I don't know if that's something that at all contributes to this and, and it's something you could talk about. I'm sure people with an ID and, you know, people with work within a hospital system, especially when we have to put on gowns and gloves for our infectious diseases. Um, is that something maybe you could talk about a little bit um, at your, at your ID rounds? Yeah, for sure. And I know um, Shira Ableist yeah. is doing all like so much of this work. So props to her, but that's a big focus for her is um, the sustainability and especially with PPE. I think she actually initiated um, moving to cloth gowns, at least at UCSD for some of these isolation rooms. So I'm right. hoping 
So that's um, great. Yeah, something she's been working on, which is very cool. But yes, a huge. Maybe obviously. you can give some updates about that. Yeah, if, yeah. If she's willing to. So sure. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Well, wonderful job. Um, and yeah, um, we appreciate the talk. More, more in June for those who want to join and things for us to all think about, especially going vegan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, have a, have a good day, everyone. All right. Thanks, Thanks so everybody. much, Sam. Mm -hmm. Wonderful job. Thanks.